Hello and welcome to another video lecture covering the BSc's Level 1 syllabus. In this lecture we're going to be looking at pericardial effusions and cardiac tamponade. And we're going to be looking at how to identify and describe effusions, as well as what clues focused echo can provide to try and estimate the hemodynamic impact of the collection. So let's begin by revising the anatomy. The pericardial sac surrounds the heart and proximal great vessels, and here we can see a heart looking at the anterior surface. On the left we have the pericardium intact, whilst on the right a large window has been cut to show the heart underneath. In the image on the left the white arrows mark out where the pericardium has been dissected off of the sternopericardial ligaments, which attach the pericardium to the front of the chest. The pericardium itself is made up of a number of layers, outermost is the parietal pericardium, furthest from the heart there's a fibrous layer made up of sheets of collagen, here we have some light microscopy slides which demonstrate the dense wavy collagen, which here stains yellow. By using an alternative stain we can highlight the endothelium of the capillaries within the fibrous layer. As we move deeper towards the heart there's a single layer of mesothelium adherent to the fibrous collagen layer. The parietal pericardium is usually up to a millimetre in thickness, and an experienced echocardiographer might be able to detect likely thickening of a parietal pericardium, but absolute measurements made with TTE are not considered reliable and are not encouraged. Beyond the parietal layer there's the visceral layer and this layer is adherent to the heart and is sometimes called the epicardium. Between the heart and the visceral mesothelial cell layer there's a thin fibrous layer and then depending on where you're looking and your individual patient there may or may not be an epicardial adipose tissue layer. Here in these two light microscopy slides on the left we can see histology of visceral pericardium with adipose tissue present whereas on the right there's no adipose tissue and the fibrous tissue is directly continuous with myocardium. Epicardial fat pads are a normal feature, but the fat isn't distributed uniformly across the heart, and tends to be most evident in the grooves between the heart chambers. Between the serosal layers, there's a small volume of pericardial fluid, which is an entirely normal finding. In health, much of this fluid can be found in recesses around the great vessels, and we don't really appreciate this fluid on focused TTE, but it is often more obvious on TOE views where we're imaging the heart from behind. In healthy individuals, I find the most common sites I appreciate normal volume pericardial fluid include the groove between the LA and the left ventricle in the plaques view, and inferior to the RA in the subcostal four chamber view, as demonstrated on these clips. When pericardial effusions are present, especially if they're simple transitive effusions, they appear as dark, usually essentially black, echo-free spaces between the two pericardial layers. In this example from a parastand long axis view, we can see pericardial fluid both anterior to the right ventricle and posterior to the left ventricle. Now this is a very clear case of a large pericardial effusion, but it's sometimes challenging to distinguish pericardial fluid with epicardial fat. So let's take a look at two further plaques views. On the left is a patient with a pericardial effusion, whilst on the right we have a dark band between the heart and the anterior chest, but this is slightly greyer rather than black, has a more speckled appearance, and it doesn't change its calibre as much across the respiratory cycle. These features help us distinguish between fluid and fat. Where fluid and fat are both present, the fat will always be attached to the heart, with a fluid more superficial. We can see this appearance in this next example, and if anything, the presence of both of these layers makes it easier to identify each. Pathological pleural fluid can arise due to pericardial disease or in some systemic conditions. This table covers some of the most common causes of pericardial effusions. Whilst echo will occasionally offer clues as to the likely etiology, it often won't, and in any case, as has been mentioned before in these lectures, uh, you need to always integrate your echo findings in with the history and the examination to help you arrive at the likely diagnosis. As sonographers, we need to be able to describe the effusion and communicate our findings with others. When measuring the diameter of a pleural effusion, we always need to measure our end diastole, the point in the cardiac cycle where the heart is most full, and therefore the effusion has its smallest diameter. There's no single location at which it's correct to make your measurement, instead it's usually advisable to make a number of measurements at different locations, which help the reader of your report understand the size and distribution of the fluid. As much as possible, make measurements from standard views, as it's often necessary to track the progress of effusion over time, and it's helpful if your measurements can be compared with measurements made previously or subsequently. In addition to describing the size and location of the effusion, you may wish to describe the appearance. Typically we divide these into simple effusions and complex effusions, which in addition to a fluid have a solid component, which might be clotted blood or pus in cases of empyema. 
This is an apical two chamber view, so a transthoracic view taken from the same window as the apical four chamber view, but with the probe rotated anti-clockwise so that the right heart chambers are not visible. Here we can see a large effusion surrounding the heart, with solid septations floating within the fluid, and this is a malignant effusion in a patient with lymphoma. So whenever we're reporting an echo we need to describe the physical findings, but in addition we need to try and consider the hemodynamic consequence of any abnormalities we discover. And pericardial effusions are no different in this respect. So every time you identify an effusion, you have to make a comment as to what impact you think it's having on the patient's hemodynamics. If you go around identifying and reporting the presence of pleural effusions, then you will be asked if the effusion is causing cardiac tamponade. So we need to have some way to address that question. As fluid builds up within the pericardial space, the intrapericardial pressure rises. The pericardium is relatively inelastic, at least in the short term. So if the fluid builds up quickly, so within minutes to hours, then the pericardium won't be able to stretch and the pericardial pressures will rise sharply. A good example of rapid fluid accumulation is in cases of bleeding. So this could be from penetrating chest trauma, could be a type A dissection, uh, could be iatrogenic, for example, RV perforation during insertion of a pacing wire. Here the bleeding occurs quickly and a relatively small volume of fluid, in these scenarios blood, will produce a relatively rapid rise in pressure. Conversely, if a fluid accumulation occurs over days to weeks, or potentially even longer, then a much greater volume of fluid is needed to produce the same pressures, because the pericardium stretches as the fluid accumulates. Regardless of whether the fluid accumulates rapidly or over a longer period of time, these pressure volume curves exhibit an initial relatively flat portion where there remains some compliance within the pericardium, so rises in volume produce only modest pressure rises, followed by a sudden transition to a steep curve where any additional volume rapidly raises the intrapericardial pressure at the point at which the pericardium's ability to stretch has become overwhelmed. As the effusion grows and the pressure rises, some of this pressure rise will be transmitted through into the heart cavities and the pressures within the heart, and most importantly for us, the atrial pressures and the ventricular diastolic pressures will rise. Now typically in healthy individuals, the chamber with the lowest mean pressure is the right atrium, followed by the left atrium. So as an effusion begins to develop, pericardial pressure will start off being below the pressures seen within all of the heart chambers. But as it rises, it will first equal and then exceed right atrial pressure, then reach and exceed left atrial pressure. In our last lecture, looking at volume assessment, we looked at Guyton's model, which describes one of the major determinants of venous return and, and hence cardiac output as being the gradient between the mean systemic filling pressure and the right atrial pressure. So if a pericardial effusion is pressing on the atria and raising right atrial pressure, then it will reduce venous return, reduce preload and reduce cardiac output. In this study, Reggie and colleagues performed invasive hemodynamic assessment in 76 patients undergoing pericardiocentesis. They inserted a PA catheter and used this to measure right atrial pressure, and they measured pulmonary artery occlusion pressure as a surrogate for left atrial pressure. They measured the pericardial pressure by transducing the line that was being used to drain the fluid. And they estimated cardiac output using a, the PA catheter and using a variety of dilution methods. So thermodilution in some patients, and indocyanine green in others. They measure cardiac output prior to draining the effusion, and then again after draining the effusion, looking to see if and by how much the cardiac output increases once the effusion has been drained. They divided their patients into three groups. In group one were patients in whom the pericardial pressure was lower than the atrial pressure. In group two, the pericardial pressure had risen to the point of equaling or exceeding right atrial pressure, but was lower than left atrial pressure. And in group 3, the pericardial pressure had risen to the point that it had equaled or exceeded both right and left atrial pressure. This table shows us some of the key pressure and flow measurements made divided into these three groups. Remember, group 1 contains the patients in whom pericardial pressure was below the pressure within both atria. So this is the group expected to have the least hemodynamic impact. Whilst the patients in group 3 are those in the most extreme situation where pericardial pressure has reached or exceeded the pressures within both atria. So if we look at the patients in group 1, they start with an average pericardial pressure of 6, a right atrial pressure of 10, and a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which we're using as a rep to represent left atrial pressure, of 13. Cardiac output in this group was initially 5.8 litres per minute. The investigators then drained the effusions and they aspirated an average of 408 mils of fluid, 
and this reduced the pericardial volume, brought the pressure down to zero, and led to a modest fall in both atrial pressures, and a modest rise in cardiac output, from 5.8 litres per minute to 6 litres per minute. In group 2, they started with a pericardial pressure of 9, a right atrial pressure of 10, and a left atrial pressure of 15. These patients started with lower cardiac outputs and averaged just 5.2 litres per minute. These patients had an average of 750 ml of pericardial fluid aspirated, and just as in group 1, aspirating fluid reduced not only pericardial pressure, but also RA and LA pressure. And there was now a significant rise in cardiac output, up to 6.3 litres per minute. In the third and final group, the volume of fluid within the pericardial space was almost identical to the patients in group 2, an average of 745 ml. However, here the pericardial pressures were significantly higher, presumably due to lower pericardial compliance. This group started with a pericardial pressure of 16. Their average cardiac output prior to fluid being aspirated was 4.4 litres per minute, but this increased by over 60% following pericardiocentesis. One of the things that these results show us is that cardiac tamponade is not a binary on-off state, but rather that any degree of pathological fluid accumulation might begin to impact on diastolic filling of the heart, and thus stroke volume and cardiac output. My personal opinion is that it's conceptually unhelpful to ask if an effusion is causing tamponade and to expect a yes-no answer. Rather, we should think of the effusion as causing a spectrum of hemodynamic consequences, and that these consequences increase as the pericardial pressure rises, and become increasingly significant as they approach and then exceed atrial pressure. Now, you may have seen written in ECHO reports that cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis rather than an ECHO diagnosis, and there is definitely some truth to this. I would probably refine the statement to say that to make a diagnosis of tamponade, you require both clinical and ECHO findings. Whilst the ECHO alone is not enough to say that your patient is in tamponade, there are definitely some echo features which are highly suggestive and become diagnostic in the right clinical setting. Some of these findings can be seen using 2D and M mode alone, and these are well within the competence of someone training in focused echocardiography, and these are the findings that we're going to focus on. Of course, any comprehensive assessment of blood flow requires the use of spectral Doppler, which is beyond the scope of a level 1 examination, and therefore beyond the scope of this lecture. So what do we see in 2D echo as a pleural effusion begins to cause cardiac tamponade? So an early sign of developing tamponade is right atrial collapse. We've already stated that in health, the right atrium is a chamber with the lowest average pressure, and we saw in Reader's study how pericardial pressure rises to equal RA pressure as the effusion increases in both size and significance. Of course, RA pressure varies across the cardiac cycle, and understanding this cyclical variation allows us to understand the echo appearance. Alright, here we have a typical right atrial pressure trace sitting just above an ECG trace so that we can revise the changes in RAP throughout the cardiac cycle. Initially we've got an A wave, and this is the rise in RA pressure brought about by atrial contraction, assuming that our patient is in sinus rhythm. Next we have the C wave, which coincides with the closure of the tricuspid valve, and following the C wave we have the X descent. So the X descent, this is the drop in RA pressure which occurs because the tricuspid valve moves or is sort of pulled away from the right atrium, moving apically during ventricular systole. The V wave is the rise in right atrial pressure that occurs as the RA refills during the second half of systole, with blood entering the right atrium, but not yet being able to move into the RV because the tricuspid valve is still closed. And finally, we have the Y descent, which occurs when the tricuspid valve opens and blood leaves the RA, heading into the RV. So let's place a right atrial pressure trace on a graph with time on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. And we'll also mark the pericardial pressure, and we'll start with a patient without any pathological effusion, so we'll set the pericardial pressure at zero. And we'll mark on the graph the mean systemic filling pressure. And here you can see it's set just below the peak of the A wave. So MSFP is greater than RA pressure throughout almost all of the cardiac cycle, but even in healthy individuals, we'll see just a little bit of retrograde flow out of the RA and into the IVC during atrial systole. Now let's observe what happens as the pericardial fluid volume begins to rise. All three pressures rise, but the pericardial pressure rises faster than the RA pressure, which rises faster than the mean systemic filling pressure. The difference, or the pressure gradient, between the filling pressure of the RA decreases, so we have decreased venous return, 
that in addition the pericardial pressure is now starting to exceed the RA pressure at certain points in the cardiac cycle, inducing RA collapse. In healthy individuals, the RA pressure is typically lowest during early ventricular systole, and so this is when we're most likely to observe RA collapse. As pericardial pressure continues to rise, it will exceed RA pressure for a greater proportion of the cardiac cycle. And RA collapse occurring for more than one third of the cardiac cycle is felt to be highly suggestive of tamponade. So here we have an example of a large pericardial effusion causing right atrial collapse. So this is an apical four chamber view. The sector has been narrowed in order just to highlight the right heart. And even when played at normal speed, we can see that the right atrial free wall is collapsing in. But if we slow this down and then freeze it, we can see that it's during early systole that the collapse is at its greatest. Following the right atrium, the chamber with the lowest pressure is the right ventricle during early diastole, when it would normally be filling from the right atrium. And so as tamponade develops, we may see right ventricular collapse. So here we have a parastatal long axis view from a patient with a moderate pericardial effusion. And this is quite a good view for visualising that RV free wall collapse that we're talking about. So here we can see that during systole the RV free wall moves in as we would expect it to do. And then as we transition from systole into diastole, we see a second inward movement before the RV starts to fill. This can be tricky to visualise when the clip is playing in full speed. And a technique you might find helpful to visualise this is M mode. So here we can zoom in on the RV free wall, place our M mode cursor through the effusion, and visualise the motion of the RV free wall during different phases of the cardiac cycle. Having an ECG lead attached to a patient would have been really useful here, but unfortunately wasn't possible for infection control reasons. Another 2D echo finding that should be known to the level 1 sonographer is plethora of the IVC. We've seen how rising pericardial pressure in turn causes right atrial pressure to rise, and in our last lecture on volume assessment, we saw that one of the factors that influences both IVC diameter and IVC variability is right atrial pressure. When we're examining a patient with pericardial effusion, we look for distension of the internal jugular vein. And looking at the IVC is the ultrasound equivalent of this. In this paper by Himmelman and colleagues, the investigators looked at 115 patients with moderate or large pericardial effusions, all of whom were spontaneously ventilating. The authors looked at a number of 2D echo findings associated with cardiac tamponade, including plethoric IVC, which they defined as being IVC collapsibility at less than 50%. Patients who were deemed to be in tamponade had significantly lower IVC collapsibility during deep inspiration, at an average of just 16% versus 33% in patients judged not to be in tamponade. They found that in spontaneously ventilating patients, in the context of a large pericardial effusion, a plethoric IVC was highly sensitive for cardiac tamponade, but not very specific. This is probably consistent with what we know about the relationship between right atrial pressure and the IVC. A distended and fixed calibre IVC will usually be seen when right atrial pressure rises, but there are numerous causes of high right atrial pressure, so we shouldn't expect this to be a specific sign. When measuring the IVC, you can either use a frozen 2D clip, or if you're able to get good alignment between the cursor and the vessel wall, then you can use M mode. If we take a look at these two frozen M mode clips, on the left we have a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage whose pericardial effusion was an incidental finding. They were relatively hemodynamically stable, and cardiac tamponade wasn't in the clinician's mind when the scammer was requested. This patient was being mechanically ventilated, but with the ventilator providing CPAP, but no pressure support. So the dominant change in the pleural pressure during inspiration is negative, and so we see the IVC collapse during inspiration. This scenario isn't perfectly analogous to a patient who isn't ventilated, because we do have the application of PEEP, and many modern ventilators do add a little bit of extra pressure support, sometimes called automatic tube compensation, which may have been in play here. But still, we can probably expect this patient's heart-lung interactions to behave more like a patient who is spontaneously ventilating than someone who's receiving full mechanical ventilation. In this case, we can see that the IVC is 17 mm in diameter when it's at its most full, and it falls down to 13 mm, which represents a collapse of just under 25%.
So this patient would meet Himmelman's definition of a plethoric IVC, but they were felt to clinically not be in tamponade. Now let's compare this with the MO graph on the right. This is taken from a spontaneously ventilating patient, uh, so purely negative pressure, inspiratory change, and pleural pressure. And this is a patient with a malignant pericardial effusion. And this patient is unwell, and they subsequently went for an emergency pericardiocentesis. Here the IV starts out being very distended at 27 millimeters. And even though this patient's got a high work of breathing, drawing in large tidal volumes, there's so little variation in the IVC calibre that I didn't even bother to measure it. So this is a really good example of a plethoric IVC, so it's large volume and it doesn't change its calibre across a respiratory cycle. One point I should make about the use of M mode here is consider the sweep speed at which the machine's been set. So on the left we've got a sweep speed of 33 millimetres per second and on the right 25 millimetres per second. So both of these clips have been recorded with the sweep speed set intentionally very slow, designed to capture several respiratory cycles. What you don't want to do is set the sweep speed really fast, say 150 or 200 millimeters per second, and then you only end up with a few cardiac cycles and perhaps not even one complete respiratory cycle. Another clinical finding reported in patients with cardiac tamponade is pulsus paradoxus which is a fall in systemic blood pressure due to a transient relative decrease in left ventricular output during inspiration. Now, before we get in too deep, it's worth stating that even when only considering spontaneous ventilation, heart-lung interactions are complex and variable, and are influenced by the patient's circulating volume, any airways disease, and the patient's work of breathing. So the following description is a necessary oversimplification of the more complicated situation. It's also worth stating that changes in flow across the respiratory cycle are best appreciated on echo using spectral Doppler. But having said that, there are a few things we can look for using 2D echo which allow us to appreciate this phenomenon. So as we've touched on previously, changes in flow across the respiratory cycle is an entirely normal occurrence. But certain conditions can cause this variation to become exaggerated, and one of those conditions is tamponade. Here we can see a graph of right atrial pressure compared with mean systemic filling pressure. The variation in right atrial pressure is exaggerated here to make the changes more obvious. So as we take a breath in, the pleural pressure falls and the right atrial pressure falls, but the mean systemic filling pressure doesn't fall because the systemic vessels are mostly extrathoracic. So we get an increase in the gradient between MSFP and RAP and an increase in the flow into the right atrium. So during inspiration, right heart filling increases, RV preload increases, and so does RV stroke volume. So the right heart handles and ejects more blood during inspiration, it sends more blood to the left heart during inspiration, and during expiration, it sends relatively less. What happens if the left side of the heart in health is more complex because the left atrium and pulmonary circulation are both intrathoracic. So both left atrial pressure and pulmonary venous pressure fall. Nevertheless, what we observe when we use spectral Doppler in the pulmonary veins and across the mitral valve is a drop in flow into and out of the left atrium during inspiration. So what we observe in health is that inspiration causes a brief rise in RV ejection, a fall in LV ejection, and this situation reverses in expiration when RV ejection falls and LV ejection increases. Remember, assuming there are no shunt lesions, the total blood ejected from both sides of the heart must be the same. But this is averaged over a number of beats and is not true beat for beat. When a pericardial effusion develops and progresses towards tamponade, this normal respiratory variation becomes exaggerated. Now, the exact mechanism is imperfectly understood, but some possible explanations have been proposed. One theory is that the raised pericardial pressure creates a rigid box around the heart, so that any increase in RV volume limits the LV's ability to fill, and vice versa. An alternative theory is that whilst the changes in pleural pressure during the respiratory cycle are transmitted to both the LA and pulmonary veins, the rise in pericardial pressure principally affects the LA, and so during inspiration the pulmonary venous pressure drop is greater than that seen in the LA, and so the gradient is decreased. Of course, it's completely plausible that there are multiple mechanisms at play simultaneously. And whatever the exact mechanism, the practical upshot is a fall in systemic flow and pressure on inspiration. You can see this clinically by feeling the pulse of a patient with tamponade, and you can feel the pulse volume decrease when they draw a breath. 
In the most extreme cases, the pulse may become completely impalpable during inspiration. If we go back to Reddy's study of 77 patients with pericardial effusions and with different degrees of hemodynamic impact, we can see that in group 1, so the patients in whom the pericardial pressure hadn't yet reached the uh, atrial pressure, the average drop in systolic blood pressure during inspiration was 12 millimeters of mercury. Now, if we compare this with group 3, so these were the sickest patients in whom pericardial pressure had already reached both right and left atrial pressure, well, these patients had an average drop in systolic blood pressure on inspiration of 26 millimeters of mercury. In all three groups, once the effusion was drained, the systolic drop decreased down to less than 10. How can we observe this using 2D echo? Well, let's start with this M-mode image taken in the parastellar long axis with the cursor placed across the aortic valve. Here we can see the aortic valve opening and closing over the course of a cardiac cycle. And you can observe how the degree and duration of valve opening varies beat to beat. When the patient took a breath in, the LV stroke volume dropped and so we can see reduced valve opening, reflecting the reduction in blood flow crossing that valve. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that you should be routinely looking for this sign. This was an extreme case, and it was evident the patient required urgent pericardiocentesis even without this particular sign. However, I think this is a nice example of how changes in flow can be demonstrated with just those basic tools at the disposal of someone trained in level 1 echo. You might also notice the variable displacement of the interventricular septum at different times. So if a pericardial volume does create a rigid box and there's alternating preferential filling of the two ventricles, then the interventricular septum will shift back and forth during respiration. If we look at this MMO graph taken from a parastellar long axis view, then we can plot the position of the interventricular septum at the same point in the cardiac cycle and see how it moves towards the probe and towards the anterior chest wall during expiration when RV filling is at its least and then it moves away from a probe, away from the anterior chest wall during inspiration when the RV filling is relatively great when compared to the LV filling. This alternating preferential filling of the two ventricles and displacement of the septum is responsible for the most dramatic echo finding in tamponade, the swinging heart, where the heart is floating in the effusion and rocks back and forth towards and away from the anterior chest wall. So here we have another apical four-chamber view, and we can see that the heart is floating in a large pericardial effusion. And as the clip plays, we can see that the heart seems to swing from the left to the right and back again. And importantly, the phase of this swing seems to be out of sync with the cardiac cycle, and it's actually synchronised with the patient's respiration. As we slow the clip down, we can place two sets of markers on the image. In each set, we're going to mark out the apex of the left ventricle and the centre of the interventricular septum. At exactly the same phase of the cardiac cycle, the onset of systole as the mitral valve first closes. And then if we lay those on our clip side by side, we can see that on inspiration, the heart is pushed over towards the right-hand side of the image as the RV preferentially fills. And on expiration, we've got preferential filling of the left ventricle and the heart is pushed to the left as we look at it. So far, we have only considered patients who are spontaneously ventilating, patients in whom there is an exclusively negative intrapleural pressure change. What about patients who are being mechanically ventilated? So in this paper, Muller and colleagues used an animal model of cardiac tamponade to investigate the impact of mechanical ventilation. So they took five baboons, anaesthetized them, and inserted a catheter into the pleural space to measure pleural pressure, and two catheters into the pericardial space one to measure the pressure and the other to instill saline in order to mimic an evolving pericardial tamponade. They also inserted an arterial line and a PA catheter so that they could measure pressure in the femoral artery, right atrium, pulmonary artery and the wedge pressure as a surrogate for the LA pressure, but also so that they could estimate cardiac output. Once they were all set up, the anaesthetized baboons were allowed to breathe spontaneously with no respiratory support, so exclusively negative pressure ventilation. Pressure measurements were taken and then they instilled saline until they had induced pulsus paradoxus and the systolic femoral artery pressure had dropped below 60% of baseline, which they considered consistent with tamponade. They then took pressure readings with the baboon breathing spontaneously, followed by full positive pressure without the application of PEEP. And finally, positive pressure with PEEP. Example tracings from one typical baboon can be seen here. So in the first set of measurements, there's no pericardial fluid and no tamponade. 
shifts in pleural pressure are negligible, and this translates to shuttle shifts in intracardiac pressure, which doesn't really translate into significant pressure swings in the femoral artery. In the second set of measurements, we now have an elevated pericardial pressure, and we can see that the mean right atrial and left atrial pressures have also both risen. If we look at the pleural pressure trace, we can identify a period of inspiration evidenced by a fall in the pleural pressure. This event leads to a rise in pulmonary artery pulse pressure and hence pulmonary artery flow, i.e. more blood is being ejected from the right ventricle into the PA. If we look at set number three, when the baboon is switched to positive pressure ventilation, we can identify inspiration by looking for a rise in pleural pressure. When positive pressure is applied, we see that the pressure also rises in both atria, but the flow in the pulmonary artery now falls, whilst flow in the femoral artery rises. The application of PEEP, which is shown in the fourth set of graphs, maintains the same heart-lung interaction, but further reduces venous return by raising the right atrial pressure further and reducing the gradient from mean systemic filling pressure to right atrial pressure. The application of PEEP here causes the cardiac output to drop even further. So when patients with pericardial effusions large enough to cause tamponade are subjected to positive pressure ventilation, the normal heart-lung interaction becomes reversed, such that RV output falls during inspiration, whilst LV output rises. But in addition, there is an overall reduction in cardiac output due to reduced venous return. Now, if the heart-lung interactions are reversed in patients receiving mechanical ventilation, can we expect to see those same signs we found on spontaneously ventilating patients, but just reversed? Well, unfortunately not really, as animal models show us that the normal heart-lung interaction is reversed, but also blunted. This data is from an experiment in which nine anaesthetized and mechanically ventilated dogs underwent echocardiographic assessment of flow through the left heart as tamponade was induced and then relieved. This table is quoting transmitral flow velocities, which we can consider here as analogous to the amount of blood that is passing through the left heart. Here we can see that the flow across the mitral valve drops as tamponade develops. However, whilst in spontaneous ventilation we see a reduction in flow and an increase in respiratory variability, when we switch to mechanical ventilation, we see that same reduction in flow, but now there is a reduction in respiratory variability. So those echo signs that we might see of respiratory variation across the cardiac cycle, well, they're not going to be present, or certainly not present to the same degree, in patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation. Of course, it's also important to remember the point we stressed in the last lecture, which is that in modern intensive care practice, the majority of ventilated patients in the ICU will be receiving a hybrid mode of ventilation with a mixture of positive and negative intrathoracic pressure changes across the respiratory cycle. And in these patients, looking for these signs is not particularly helpful. Okay, so so far we've been exclusively talking about one type of collection around the heart, one type of collection that might cause tamponade, and that is a liquid that envelops the heart, that sort of covers the heart globally. And all of these collections are sometimes lumped together with the umbrella term of being medical effusions. But tamponade can also arise when you've got a local collection or a local extrinsic mass pressing on the heart. We see this not infrequently in post-operative patients following cardiac surgery who have bleeding post-operatively, but occasionally we also see this due to intrathoracic masses, which lead to external compression. So typically these are much more difficult than global effusions uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, you might well miss it from one of your standard views. One of the nice things about having a global pericardial effusion is that even if you haven't got a perfect set of images, usually one or two windows will show the effusion even if you can't see it in, in the others. But with local collections, that may not be the case. In addition, local collections may not behave in the same way as global effusions with respect to heart-lung interactions. And those heart-lung signs may be absent. Let's take a look at a few examples. So the first case is from somebody who's had cardiac surgery this is from a middle-aged lady who's had a mitral valve replacement and a tricuspid valve repair. And there was no evidence of any collection in the parasternal views. Subcostal views weren't possible because of the presence of epicardial drains. And it's only from the apical window that you can see this hematoma surrounding the right atrium. I think post-op cardiac surgical patients are a really difficult group to scan. They often have very challenging transthoracic windows. And even a relatively small hematoma, if it's in the wrong place, can limit flow through the heart. Here are two more apical four-chamber views from a different patient. So this is an elderly gentleman who'd had a coronary artery bypass graft around about two weeks before these were taken. He was doing well in the immediate post-operative period, but at the time of this scan he'd suddenly deteriorated with chest pain, 
and profound shock, so he was now on a mic of noradrenaline and had an elevated and rising lactate. And I sympathise with anybody who has to try and interpret these images. And indeed, the cause of this patient's collapse wasn't identified immediately, and it wasn't until his CT scan was performed subsequently. But we can see this very large hematoma pressing on the right atrium, almost completely obliterating the cavity. And you can see how it narrows the exit of right atrium into the right ventricle, which explains this sort of narrow jet of blood that we can see passing from the RA into the RV during diastole. This next paper goes some way to describe the difficulties in using echo, and specifically transthoracic echo, to identify postoperative cardiac tamponade. In this study, the authors retrospectively reviewed the case notes of 124 patients who underwent restenotomy for postoperative bleeding or tamponade within 72 hours of their original surgery. And this was approximately 5% of all the patients operated on during the study period. Now, the majority of patients returned to theatre based on clinical suspicion alone, without having had a scan to look for an effusion. However, we can see that in 50 patients who all did have postoperative bleeding, a transthoracic echo was performed, but the effusion was only seen in 20 patients. So in 60% of the cases, the effusion was missed on transthoracic echo. Of those 30 patients in whom no effusion was seen, two went straight to theatre, whilst 28 proceeded to have a transesophageal echo, which always identified the effusion. What's more, in 80% of patients who had a scan that showed an effusion that prompted a return to theatre, there were no classical features of tamponade present. My take-home message from this study is that TTE will frequently, indeed usually, miss significant post-operative effusions occurring after early surgery, and it shouldn't be relied upon. It's probably a reasonable rule-in test, so if you see an effusion, then it probably is there, but if you can't see one and you have any sort of index of suspicion, you really need to go for a TOE. This next clip shows one such example. So this is a patient who deteriorated on the first night following valve surgery. Transthoracic views were completely non-diagnostic, you couldn't see anything, but on TOE, in these transgastric views, we could immediately identify a very large hematoma that was immediately evacuated. I'm going to show a few more examples of localised collections because these don't come around all too often. So this is a subcostal clip, this is from an elderly gentleman who presented four days after the onset of chest pain, and he had an ECG showing inferior ischemia. And on his echo we can see this hematoma inferior to the RV, which is due to RV free wall rupture. These next two clips are from the same patient, a middle-aged man. On the left is a transthoracic subcostal clip, whilst on the right we have a TOE clip. And this is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view, rotated to focus on the right atrium and right ventricle. And this collection we can see outside the heart is echo bright compared with the blood inside the heart, and this looks a little like hematoma, but is in fact pericardial empyema due to streptococcus. These next two cases are both of intrathoracic cancers. So first we have some TTE clips, we've got an apical four-chamber and a subcostal view, showing a mass causing external compression of right atrium. And then these next two clips are both from a TOE of a young patient with mediastinal lymphoma. So on the left we have a mid-esophageal long axis view which demonstrates similar anatomy to what we might see in the parasternal long axis. And on the right we've got an RV inflow outflow view, which is kind of similar to a parasternal short axis at the level of the greater vessels. And in these two clips we can see tumour bulk compressing the right ventricle at the level of the right ventricular outflow tract. Now, I think it's beyond the scope of this lecture to go into the management of pericardial effusions and specifically cardiac tamponade, other than to say that these can be immediately life-threatening, and so if you do find a concerning effusion, or if you're not sure, then clearly you need to get an immediate review from someone with the appropriate training and expertise. Okay, so let's summarise what we've covered so far. Okay, so first of all, it's normal to have some fluid in the pericardial space, but any volume of fluid that causes clear, visible separation of the pericardial layers is probably too much to be considered physiological. When pericardial fluid is present, you need to report the location of the fluid, how much fluid there is, so its diameter at end diastole, and what the fluid looks like. Is it clear, simple effusion? Are there septations? Is there any solid matter within the space? Once you've identified an effusion, you need to try and assess what impact it's having on the hemodynamics. This starts by looking at the patient, and considering clinical characteristics like heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, etc. 
In addition to the clinical information, there are some echo features that suggest tamponade, and within the tools available to the level 1 sonographer, you might be able to pick up right atrial collapse, right ventricular collapse, or a distended and non-collapsing IVC. Features of excessive variation in flow across a respiratory cycle may be present, but only in spontaneously ventilating patients. And in patients who've had cardiac surgery, level 1 echo should not be used to exclude the possibility of post-operative bleeding.